my guest today it's one of the most kickers project managers network builders and creative overall today we'll be talking about how to survive layoff season how to mentor your old self and the power of creative networks so without further ado let's talk to my guest Natalie Herwood and Natalie such a pleasure to have you here today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, you're one of probably the most interesting people to talk to because, A, you got something that I really appreciate, which is you pull no punches. You know, I know with you, I always know what you think. And I think nowadays yeah. that's more valuable than ever. One of the things I've noticed about your profile is that you are what many would call the jack of all trades. You know, you got the project management part, you got the creativity part, you're a producer, you are a director of network, you know, and many times when I needed creatives, I reach out to you and within a couple of hours, you had someone for me to interview and work on a project. And it's always like really reliable people. Let's talk about the value of being a jack of all trades in the current climate for creative workers? Yeah. So with all of my roles, there's always that through line of managing, right? But you can't just be specialized anymore. You can't be like, I only do this and I don't do anything else. And everything has to stay in this sphere because jobs can be taken away from you at any moment and you have to be able to adapt. And then even within jobs, you have sometimes companies in an effort to try to push people out will give you an ultimatum of you can take this role or you can leave. And in the economy that we have right now, you have to be able to say, okay, mind you, you know, I get that that was what it used to be, but this is kind of just what we're living in now. So being adaptable is super important. You kind of have to be a hyphen. You have to be a Swiss army knife when it comes to the type of work that you do. And you mentioned something, you know, about this need for literally doing everything. And I'm wondering when we were young, you know, let, let's, let's go to college now, just a couple of months ago. Of um, course, just like yesterday. <laughs> just like yes, for all of us. And you were graduating <laughs> from college, you know, like you had these ideals, these dreams. Let's think about that now. What has changed since then? What are the things you've learned about the job market for creatives and the need to upskill, but also whether accomplishing these objectives is really realistic in 2024 or not? So I feel bad for everyone who's graduating in 2024. It's the same job market I graduated from in 2009, where you're coming off the heels of a recession, for people in entertainment, you're coming off the heels of a writer's strike. All of those things impacted our abilities to find jobs. So I came into the job market with some really old school thinking of you pay your dues, you start at the bottom, you work really hard, you work for the promotion, and eventually you'll get to the point that you want to get to and quickly found out that that is not realistic. <laughs> it's not realistic. It's not a way that will push you forward. If anything, it kind of sets you back if you kind of look at things from a traditional standpoint, because there's less opportunity for growth if you try to go the traditional route. It isn't to a company's benefit to push you forward. It's their benefit to move you up in increments because that controls how much they pay you. So you have to be open to learning new things, be open to switching, to make sure that your career is what you want it to be instead of handing all of the power over to whatever entity, whatever organization is paying you at that time. What are some ways in which, you know, you've been able to shape your career given the cards you're dealt, right? Yeah, I definitely did the bull in a china shop method when I started, I didn't know what I was doing. It was just like, what do I need to do to stay employed so I can pay rent? And I, I think that's kind of what people who are graduating now are going to have to deal with. So it was temping, taking on project work, learning new things was huge. That's probably my top skill set is the ability to learn something else because that's what keeps you paid. That's what makes you valuable to the places that you're working for. They know, okay, well, if I got 
a new product and I need someone to test it out, this person's going to pick it up pretty quickly and they can tell me whether or not it's worthwhile to use. And then just being able and open to talking to people. I think that's something that's really helpful. I know it's a little bit, it's a little bit more difficult now because everyone's spread out. We're dealing with a more global economy. You can't ask someone to meet you at a water cooler or get coffee or take a walk around the building like you would before. It requires a little bit more effort, but I think that's really important. And it's kind of like that network building. You start as soon as possible and while you're still in school because <laughs> that's your first network. Once you get into the workforce, it's kind of on you to build it from there. A network is such an important thing, right? For example, in my case, I'm an immigrant, you know, came seven years ago to the U.S. Most people cannot even point to my country on a map, you know, Argentina. And one of the things that when I was here, I quickly realized is in all that I've done in the past didn't matter. I was kind of like having a fresh start, you know, and I was like, well, you should network. So I remember going to these events in Santa Monica, you know, and it was yeah. always like some TED thing and you're meeting people and then most of the time nothing happens or some sort of scam. So it's very easy to feel discouraged. So what are some effective tactics keeping in mind this war of ours right now where, you know, folks are either all over the world or you don't necessarily go into an office, which I'm beyond happy because that's a waste of time for many, Same. many positions, right? Yeah. We're in an industry where people tend to have a different sensibility about things or a different view of the world. So many times an office is just a jail. <laughs> to be <Yeah>. dramatic, <laughs> you know, it's Yale. <laughs> so what are some effective techniques, techniques, you know, for networking? Like how, how the hell do we do it in 2024? I feel like you nailed it because like, I'm one of those people, like I, I have ADHD. Offices are my nightmare scenario. It causes me to have to work longer hours than I should because I get really, really distracted, especially in open uh, work environments where it's just like, okay, you're in a bullpen. You can hear everyone. Everyone can hear you. That person's typing too loud. That person's chewing. That person wants to chat. Working at home is like the perfect place for me because then I can focus. When you're starting out and you're figuring out how to network, the most important thing is to figure out what you don't like. I don't like those networking specific events. I find them awkward. It makes me feel awkward then I come into it and I don't get what I need from it. I think making genuine connections with individual people is a more stable way of networking for me. I don't, I know some people love going to networking events, but for me having one-on-one -on -one conversations where someone has introduced me to another person or we just happen to meet, whether it be through a work project or a friend, or I've met people at a bus stop before. You never know who you're going to meet or where. So just that openness to having conversations with people. Because if it's not a good match, if it's not someone that you can see yourself working with or referring, then it's easy to let go and you've just had a conversation with someone. But when things do click, those relationships can last a really long time. I've met vendors through jobs that I still talk to. And we have conversations. It'll be about the state of the industry, or maybe they're doing something new with their product and they want feedback on it. You're able to build relationships that way too. And I think something that it's very important about these creative networks, you know, that you're mentioning is the thing about how these are relationships that will last for a long time, as opposed to, you know, what we're seeing, especially in the U.S., uh, with the labor laws it has, it's very easy for a company to say, you know what, we change our mind. Thank you all. It's been a hard decision. Merry Christmas, right? But I don't see that happening, especially with creative networks. What I've been seeing more and more consistently, especially as the economy is hitting a rock. But, you know, and also in my previous life in Argentina where inflation, you know, was sometimes 40% a month. Mm -hmm. uh, the economy has consistently been in shambles and you cannot learn to make it work, you know, and the way you make it work is through these professional networks in which, you know, people, you work together, you well, you work well together, 
So the next time, of course, you're going to bring them in, you know, and hopefully you get to expand your network and bring other people as well, because also it's kind of like, sometimes you do want to avoid that sort of microclimating, which is always the same for people doing everything. Yeah. Uh, one of the things about this creative network, you know, is how powerful it can be for us as creative workers. In my experience, that literally is one of the reasons I met you, right? Because somebody else I'd worked with in the past referred me to a project. Through that project, somehow, I mean, we've worked on so many things here that I don't really know which mm -hmm. was the first one. But, you know, <laughs> you, mean, you start doing things, you go through those late night deliveries together. Obviously, yeah. there's a bond. And in your case, I always find someone that it's on top of her stuff. If you say something's going to get done in a specific time, it gets done. So obviously you're someone that I'd be like, hey, you need a project manager. You got to talk to Natalie. Don't even waste your time. I mean, and obviously there's a lot of creatives, but I guess the question I'm trying to get to is how to differentiate, you know, because, okay, we got all these folks on a network. Yep. How do you stand out? That's where it gets tricky, right? I know for myself, I use a spreadsheet and I try to have conversations with people. I'm trying at this point because of how things are going people are switching industries. So you have to be better at keeping up with people, asking people how they're doing, seeing where they're at and just getting better yourself. So it's like you said, you create this microcosm of people that you work with. And when you surround yourself with people who are doing good work, you tend to do good work yourself, right? Like the people you surround yourself are a reflection of who you are also. So what I think is important is making sure that you're not just staying in that circle, just like you said, but going outside of it. And it's like, well, who have you met? Maybe that's somebody that I can work with, or maybe they're just a good person to know because someone else might ask, and then I can refer that person. It's just this kind of this mindset of really being a creative collective of truly wanting something, not just for your own well-being. And of course, everyone's going to want to make sure that they take care of themselves, but it's almost like keeping a healthy ecosystem. Everybody needs to work. So if you're able to help someone else get work, even if it means you don't get work, it doesn't matter. It's still good. At the end of the day, somebody is still able to move forward and you don't know what ripple effects that could have. As cold as it is, I have my little spreadsheet. I put people in it <laughs> and I try to have relevant information for someone who might want to hire. Sometimes people are like, I need someone who is first generation, or I need someone who is an immigrant, or I need someone who's a woman with a background in this, or a man who is a background in that because we're doing a documentary or we're building a website or we're doing whatever. You don't know what people are necessarily going to ask for so by making sure that you're continuously strengthening the bonds you have and building new ones, you become better yourself. It kind of forces you to stay on your toes and kind of keep your fingers on the pulse of what's going on when you talk to people, because otherwise it's really easy to kind of get stuck in a rut of whatever your job is and just being heads down in your job and not paying attention to what's going on in the further reaches of whatever industry you're in, because all of those things have an impact. It's so interesting what you say about the collective, you know, because I think that's what I envision, right? I mean, companies will always be here. Agencies will always be here, no matter whether we get AI or robots yeah. or like, you know, aliens popping up. Agencies, I feel like they will still be here. They will have to go and many will be different that they shape they have today or the form but i do think the future having a lot more of these collectives of creators in which they join forces together because at the end of the day i do think that's the only way you can sort of warranty some stability by having this sort of like compounding power you know in which i know okay i'm part of this collective i get access to these projects someone reaches out like hey i need to do this uh, i need 36 educational videos, right, on X, Y, and C. Uh, right. I need you to build a team. So obviously, you know, I'm going to be helping, like, if I have an amazing project manager, if I have a, an amazing media editor, of course I'm going to call them. You know, 
who who else would I bring in, right? And I know they will do the same. So I see this, honestly, it's something that we should all strive for, just building this creative collectives and helping each other, right? Like everybody has to pull their weight. Now, let me put myself, I'm going to put my startup bro hat on and let's talk about value. Because right now, this conversation, we... We can be very poetic, you know, what the value creators can provide and how work should be properly compensated, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, we know whoever, or most of the times, whoever's paying for that might not necessarily care, you know, or might not necessarily have those same values. They might just be looking at a spreadsheet and saying, we're in the red or we're in the black, right? Yep. So... How can creative, creative workers display this value for agencies, companies, brands, et cetera? Yeah, I think that's that's really about taking advantage of the resources you have, right? So whether you can afford a website or you use a free one, doesn't really matter. It's about how you lay it out. And I know we've had conversations about this in the past where you have to hire someone And the next thing you know, you have 100, 200, 300 resumes in front of you and you have to go through them and somehow sort out between those people and very quickly. Like my time of scanning resumes and websites has gotten very fast. It's like, if it's not good, I bail. Like we need to know what your portfolio is, if you have any other websites where your work is, especially if you're like a graphic designer, if you have like a Behance, a personal website, an Instagram and all these other things, making sure that all the information is like quickly accessible and not falling into the trap that a lot of non-designers fall into where you have 80 million different pages to show off 80 million different projects instead of letting me just scroll through it and just use it intuitively. It's like we build sometimes against what's just intuitive and make it way too complicated. It's just like simple, make it simple, make it easier on yourself and the person who's looking at everything when they're coming to review your work and just try to put your best foot forward. Think about the person who's going to be looking at it and what you want them to take from it. I know for mine, I have like a small offshoot of a website that has all of my different portfolio pieces but they're not meant to be viewed in a scrollable way. It's meant to be, you're looking at my resume and you click on the link because you want to see what I did for that particular job. It's not always appropriate to show everything depending on what the role is. So it's like, I want that person to choose. And if they decide to delve deeper, awesome. But I really want them to look at that specific thing. Natalie, one of the things you say here that it really resonates with me is this, you put a job posting up, right? And you're going to have 300 super talented people showing up and saying, hey, I can do a job. And they definitely can. So how do you go from those five seconds that you will usually dedicate as you're going through 300 portfolios to the, oh, I got 30 seconds for you. I got a minute because something caught my attention. Do you see a, a factor that you can attribute like, this is the kind of thing that will be attention grabbing in a creative project, right? When we're talking about creative project management, production, mm-hmm. videographer, etc. I think when someone who has a really creative role is looking for a way to show themselves to the broader world for hiring, right? You have to take what the client is needing into consideration. They need your discretion. So using passwords when you're showing anything that could be a client project so that it's just not open to the world. Making sure that if you have a highly visual role but are not a designer yourself, that you go as simple as possible so that you don't make a mistake that makes your website too difficult for someone to navigate because they're not going to take the time to. If it takes forever to find your email, if it takes forever to find a resume, if it takes forever to find a reel, they're going to move on to the person who makes it easier to do. And then if you are someone who doesn't have a lot of experience, but you're qualified, which is a phrase that I love, someone who is ready for the role, but might not necessarily have gotten the opportunity, make the opportunity for yourself. 
So my favorite example in terms of someone who impressed me with something that kept me on their website much longer than I expected to, I had like two different individuals. One was a director, one was a DP. The DP made a video that told an entire story in I think like two minutes of someone just leaving their home, going on the train and going to the museum. And it, I stayed. <laughs> I could have just stayed for the first couple seconds and said, yeah, they know how to shoot a good video and move on. But the story they were telling was engaging enough to keep me there. And that in, a, in and of itself tells me that this is a person to consider because I should have said good enough and moved on, but I stayed. And then for another person, I was basically, it was a smaller pool. So I was able to give everyone a little bit more time went on to his website. He had a password, of course, for what he had, which is wonderful. But I ended up watching a feature. I meant to stay for five minutes and ended up working past when I was supposed to work because I sat there and I watched his entire documentary because Why? he told such a good story that I figured I can get everything else done later tonight. So I'm just gonna watch this. I'm already in it. I wanna know how this story ends. They were just really, really good storytellers. When people present their best work, even if it's something they have to make up themselves, it makes you want to share it with other people. And that's kind of what you want to create as a creative person, even if it's something that's not highly visual, like project management. I know in my particular case, my website isn't gorgeous because I'm not really relying on images, but I do rely on being able to tell the story of whatever project I was working on that I'm choosing to highlight. I can't for every single job highlight every single project. It's not always appropriate. And sometimes they're not that interesting. But when you're able to find something interesting, you can just say, hey, this is what I did for this role. Here's a highlight project. Here's why it was a highlight for me. And then kind of move on from there. Now, it's always better to have some sort of visual just for people who need that and you do it where you can. But that kind of stuff comes from experience, right? You have to know that if you build websites, take screenshots of all your websites, take screenshots in multiple viewings. Like you can't just do the desktop, make sure you get a screenshot of the mobile view, get a tablet view, get a view scrolling through it. Do whatever you can to make your presentation of that project later more exciting. Like I've had to go back. <laughs> I've had to go to Wayback Machine and pull old projects because I never thought at the time to document them. I was just like, well, project's done, move on to the next project. I wasn't thinking <laughs> ahead for needing to tell people about the work I did because in my like 2010s brain, it wasn't about the future, it was about right now I'm working, so I needed work and just focus on that. But as creatives, we can't do that. That's a, it's a detriment to our careers. We have to look forward too. So it's like, yes, I'm working on this now. If you do something cool, document the hell out of it. How many people visited? How many people watched it? How many people shared it? Because those are things you can use to land the next job. You said something that I feel if people is going to take any takeaway from it is this, which is sort of like how you don't need the validation to create. You don't need anyone's approval. No. And I think that's one of the most important things we can say to creative workers, yeah. right? It's very easy to fall into despair. We all got to pay bills and, you know, money doesn't go a long way right now with inflation, like prices go up, etc. We all know what we're going through right now. But that's the thing, you know, we can still, we're allowed to have fun. We're allowed to create. So we might as yeah. well don't give that away. Is there a project that you can make with little to no money and that will showcase your value? Do it. Don't let your creativity and your joy get rusty because at the end of the day you might not have a i work with this company in the pharmacy industry and we created a hundred educational videos on you know 
whatever thing they want right. to sell next. How to use next. your insulin. <laughs> yeah, how to use your insulin, which again, it's, you know, I'm sure diabetics, that's a very important thing to know. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, right. That's the thing about all of these jobs though, right? It's like all of these jobs in some form or fashion have their place, but we can't grant those roles to, we can't give our employers too much power over our lives. Yes, they employ us, but we also work for them. It's an exchange. So when you put yourself into a worker bucket and you don't allow yourself to leave it, or you're waiting on some form of validation from a company, you hurt yourself in the end, right? So I like, millions of conversations we've had it's like I, my my small forms of corporate rebellion are i decide who i am and i decide where i work from like i'm not going to move for a job unless you pay me a lot <laughs> of money i'm not moving anywhere other than where i want to be for work and my linkedin has like a bunch of different roles in it in terms of that little descriptor they give you to tell us about yourself. And it's like, well, I produce, I manage projects, I'm an operations person, and I really like doing puzzles. Like, I'm whatever I want to be, right? Like, I make art, I hang out with my family, I enjoy music. Like, we are so much more than the jobs that we do. And we can't just kind of fall into the trap that I think previous generations have fallen into where who we are is determined by a business card that someone else has given us. Just like make your own business cards, not hard. Tell people whatever you want to tell them. I was talking to a friend about like Mean Girls a couple of days ago and about like the little cards Kevin G gives out where it's like mathematician, badass MC. That's kind of the perspective we need to go into things with, with tell people who you are, don't let them tell you because you're the one who has to live with it. I do a bunch of different things. All of those things have a through line because that's what works for me. But outside of it, if someone says like, what do you do? It's like, I make art <laughs> and I do stuff online sometimes with companies, but that's pretty much who I am. Like that's what I most closely identify with. That's what I spend the bulk of my time doing when I'm not working is I'm working on some form of art project or I'm hanging out with the people who matter to me and catching up with friends. Like, I think we need to give ourselves more of a human experience. And all of these layoffs are just kind of pushing that home more and more and more because these roles can be taken from you, even if you're doing an amazing job with no notice. And you just kind of have to go from there. I think these layoffs give people really, it's kind of a joke to be like, I'm having an existential crisis, but I think it really happens, especially if you've worked somewhere for a really long time and invested a lot of yourself into it instead of creating that balance for yourself and living your life. Take back that power. You get to define who you are. You get to show the work you want to do. And yes, sometimes there might be no money, you know, so maybe you cannot shoot Godzilla 22. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you, you might not be able to afford the CGI. You might have to do it with toys. We're, we're creatives, you know, and at the end of the day, sometimes those challenges, they will foster the creativity. And again, I don't want to go in this idealistic thing of like, you'll create and be happy because, you know, we all got to no. eat, we all got to pay rent. Absolutely but, not. Pay those bills. But, it, <laughs> but, it, but if you're going to be broke, don't be miserable, you know, try to do things. And again, try to build these networks because ultimately, like you said, there's nothing warranted nowadays. You can be the best performer yeah. and the company needs to decide then between, you know, their independent coffee shop subscription or your role. And you might lose it to independent coffee subscription, which again, sometimes you get amazing coffee. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, there's yeah. that. They need to drink coffee so they can continue disrupting. Uh, but building these networks is very important, right? And yeah. using that creativity, not only for someone who's paying you, but for yourself to enjoy life. Because ultimately, if I want to be, you know, Mr. Business Guy, that will also add to who you are as a professional. It's just expanding your creative resources. 
I can tell that from my experience, I can bring a lot of things into the table that many other folks will not have the same way that I don't have many other experiences that will work in the advantage of another creative. So I think the main thing, and this is not necessarily related to what we're talking you know, but when we talk about companies being diverse and showing diversity, that's the true value of diversity, right? Oh, People yeah. with different experiences bring in their condiment to the soup. It's not so dumb clip art or like, you know, stock footage with people dressing right, like perfect corporate haircuts, you know, and you got yeah. one of each, you know, each uh, character. So everybody, you know, box stick. But box. like, yeah, true diversity is. I grew up solving issues in the specific way because of the specific tools and limitations I had. This is the art that has inspired me. This is a TV show I grew up listening to, or this is a, for those of us that were born in the previous century, this is a radio station that yeah. influenced me. <laughs> as a kid and I'm, Truly. Myself. Uh, I'm sure that I have one too. Know, is. <laughs> if there's a, you know, one Zoomer listening, it's like radio. What? What's that? So yeah. for you to be like Jimmy and yeah. on <laughs> iHeart Radio. Yeah. Um, With, by yeah. the way, Creativity and Robots, it's on iHeart Radio. So if you're listening to this or if you're watching in YouTube, we're on iHeart Radio, Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere you can listen to a podcast, including iHeart Radio, we're there. So feel free to subscribe, follow us so you can hear amazing conversations like this one. Natalie, I have. One final question for you, and we're going back to the beginning. Let's think of that dreamy Natalie straight out of right. college. So many ideas, so much passion. You know, you probably even had a coming of age movie in your Oh my gosh, mind. probably. Probably <laughs> did. Your, your coming of age story. Think about the good things of your career, the bad things. What would you say to that fresh out of college Natalie? I would definitely focus on you and your development. I think I gave away way too much power when I started my career. I was way too focused on proving myself to individual people instead of focusing on proving things to myself. And I spent way too much time working. I didn't spend as much time as I should have with the people in my life. I think my, my network is solid now. I think it would be absolutely off the charts if I had let myself kind of just enjoy life more and figure out more about who I was and what type of life I wanted for myself instead of following that traditional path because it didn't exist anymore by the time I graduated, but no one had really acknowledged it. We were still living in that pretend world of if you follow the right path, everything will fall into place and you'll get rewarded because you were good. And it was gone. It was already and, gone. And I think to this day, right, many of us still, I mean, it's sort of like all the signals are there that that doesn't exist anymore, but we're all still yeah. sort of pretending like it's an use Oh, man. I drive, Zoomers, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, think they, I they got it right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think Zoomers are on it. Zoomers are like, oh, no, man, we're, we yeah. know what's going on. So it's like we're the millennials. It's kind of like the last, to say, generation. You know, we're kind of like, we're good on every end. We got the short stick of things because it's like we still have like the old school values, which yeah. do not exist anymore. We think about an economy that it doesn't exist anymore, nor will it exist in the future, right? So. Nope. So important for the, the kids, kids these days, you know, to know this. And they definitely know better than we do. We, we got so much to learn from they've them. They've nailed it on that respect. I think a lot, if they thought millennials killed industries, I think these folks, I think they're going to kill a lot more. I think a lot more industries are going to start to see a decline because they watched us do everything we were told and not see the results because everything is simply different. And that's okay, but I think holding on to the past is is rough. And I, like I said, I, I think I drive my family a little crazy sometimes because like I'm in the wind. I'm going with just what life hands me. And right now it's handing a lot of, you know, just instability and we're all having to ride that wave. Technology is changing the way companies higher how they work is changing 
So you kind of have to go along with it. And it's hard for people to kind of wrap their minds around it when that path was still there for them and they did it and it worked out for them and them trying to realize like, why can't you do the same thing I did? And having to explain that that no longer exists. Like, I'm very thankful that my mom gets it. It took a little bit of being like, no, trust me, it's not the same anymore. It's not even the same as it was five years ago. We're working in a different environment and we have to adjust to it. So I feel for, like I said, I feel for everyone who's graduating this year, who graduated last year, for the next few years, people who are coming into the workforce, they're going to be competing against people who have decades of experience over them, applying for the same roles they are just because they need to work in addition to their younger peers, because we're bringing back child labor. So they're going to be competing against their younger siblings. They're going to be competing against great aunts and uncles, all for the same jobs because people are just trying to survive, which is why I think it is truly, truly important that if you're a creative person, you know yourself because then work isn't as important. Work becomes a tool. It doesn't become your life. It becomes a way for you to sustain yourself so that you can make whatever you want to make. Right. If you're getting enough money to do what you want to do to create, like to scratch that creative itch, go for it. It You don't have to kill yourself to do a specific thing if what you do creatively kind of makes you happy enough to keep moving forward. Like if you want to go work in pharmaceutical and then paint on the weekends and painting makes you happy and you can sell those paintings, but the pharmaceutical job pays your bills, do that. <laughs> You don't have to have painter be the only thing on your business card. You can do both. You can be the mathematician and badass MC. You can do that too. You don't have to bucket yourself. And I think that's something that's going to be hard for people to accept, especially when the old narrative is still being pushed. But I think eventually we'll get there. Whip cover through this interview, so many gloomy topics in a way. Yeah. But... But one thing that I noticed as you speak is that you speak with a lot of passion, right? And that's kind of like why I started this podcast. I consider myself a very passionate guy about pretty much everything. <laughs> I have a passionate opinion, yeah. <laughs> that, so, which sometimes it's not that yeah. great. But, oh, I you know, know. I, I, I can tell you're passionate. When you talk, you don't talk like someone that's given up. You talk like someone that it's like just getting started. So yeah. why are you still passionate? And what creativity? Like I'm right there with everybody else in terms of these layoffs and everything. It's like work is the inevitable. But when you are a creative person, the world is kind of your oyster in a way that it isn't for people who can't visualize things differently. Like I can do whatever I want to do as long as I have the means to do it, right? So I know I, jobs are gonna be a thing. You have to have a job, it's just a part of life. So the likelihood of never working again is very small. But for me, it's kind of like, okay, I'm, I know I'm gonna work, but what's going to be really interesting in the next couple of months? So I started weaving a rug. Like I can make whatever I want. If I want to make something, I will learn how to make it. If I want to do something new, I will learn how to do it. It's just a matter of how long it takes for me to get it done. So I don't feel as closed off as I think sometimes you can feel when you put all of your eggs in one basket when it comes to work. I still have things to do outside of it. I still have meetings. I still talk to people. We still have stand-ups. Like my life hasn't stopped just because one aspect of my life has. So I think that's one thing that helps. Does it get frustrating? Absolutely. Like it can be very frustrating, especially when these layoffs continue to happen because it just makes the time it takes to find work take longer. It becomes a more competitive market and you have to work harder. But that's life. Like you can't really do anything about that. It's like, try not to get frustrated over the things that you have absolutely no control over and then just focus your efforts on the stuff that can. And then when you have a bad day, just like you're going to have a bad day. It happens to everyone. And I think giving yourself that grace is important. Like I, I straight up have pity parties 
when I feel like it's like, well, the world has ended. That's how I feel today. It's like time to have a pity party and just feel those feelings and let them go so that you can keep moving because you have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you absolutely have to. You cannot get stuck in that pity party, you know, and I think that's one of the great things about having this creativity tool is that that's sort of, at least for me, that was my North star, you know, like, sure, mm -hmm. this might have stopped, but this still remains and this is under my control. So start a project, you know, or even this, I get to talk to amazing creatives like you and I'm having fun, you know, and it's literally all it took me was my computer, a light microphone and other camera. So it doesn't look like Sue, yes. <laughs> which is this one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's it so Natalie this has been amazing yeah. um, you should start your own podcast because you have so many things to say at least I would listen I might be who knows who listen. knows what the future holds uh, talk, the words you're always we can Natalie. talk for a living right <laughs> we're, yes. we're passionate enough that we can keep it going don't get me started so <laughs> Natalie very good project manager creative network Genius. Thank you so much for being on Creativity and Robots. We appreciate you taking the time. You know, there's a lot of amazing takeaways for folks. So I hope you had as much fun as I did. Oh, Maybe not as much. Awesome. But, yeah. I'm so glad that we got the chance to do this. I think this is really, I think this is important. I think these conversations are the ones we need to have, especially right now, because people are, are having a rough time. Creative workers need to be together, need to support each other. And again, even if you're not getting anything in return, I think the only way things can get better for us is if we get together and support each other. So, right on. All right. Solidarity. <laughs> Solidarity among workers. And that's when, like, I don't know, the FEI breaks. The feds the kick like, in. We got a communist. <laughs> <laughs> so, Natalie, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to speak with me. And for the rest of you, remember, you can subscribe to Creativity and Robots on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, iHeartRadio, tons of other things I don't even know. So <laughs> if you enjoy this content, smash that like, like, kids say these days boom smash uh, that subscribe button